I'd like to call to order the January 29th, 2020 Sustainability Board meeting. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda is I'd like to open the floor up for any public comment. If anybody's come in to voice something to the Sustainability Board or um, the City in general, um, the floor is open for you. Please come to the mic, state your name, and that's it. No? No takers? Good? All right. Any public comment for the public comment? No? Okay. <laughs> Um, next sort of business, we have a presentation by the Florida Wildlife Hospital and Sanctuary. Cool. Do you mind? Please. All right. Thank you so much. We're so happy to be here today. We're going to do, if everyone can see over here, right? We're going to do um, a little presentation on what we are, first of all, what we do, and then what you guys can do if you're out and about living your life and you find something you need. I'm Tracy Branson. I'm the executive and I'm going to pass this on to um, Chelsea Dodd, our assistant director, um, for part of the presentation.
to try and get it back where it came from. So the paperwork is really important to help us along our path for rehabilitation. So we get a lot of patients. Um, last year was banner year. As you can see, um, we had 5,200, 5,500, 49, 43, and then last year was our highest number ever. At 5543. It was crazy busy last year. And as you if you've ever brought this animal, you know we never charge for someone to bring an animal in. So 5,500 patients, um, we never charge. We have 12 staff members and about 80 volunteers. Some of the volunteers are here tonight. Thank you very much. Um, we have an amazing team. We get a lot done. We do ask if someone can make a donation when they bring in an animal, but it's not required, um, and we do the best we can with all the animals that come in. Some of the common patients that we get, we get a lot of songbirds, that would be the blue jays, the mockingbirds, the grackles. The, the hospital is never quiet when there's grackles, maybe, in the nursery. It's non-stop chattering. Um, we get a lot of turtles and tortoises, gopher tortoises. Of course, their biggest thing is getting hit by cars. Um, the natural escape for a tortoise is to go into its shell if it feels threatened. Doesn't understand that a car is still going to hurt it if it goes in its shell. And so we do see a lot of gopher tortoises that have been hit by a car. Some of them are really tragic. Others look bad, and but we end up able to release them again. So you never know. Um, Sadly, they do take a very long time to perish if it is something that can't heal. So even if it looks really horrible and you know it's going to die, it's better to bring it into us so we can kind of speed it along because sometimes it can take weeks for them to pass away. It's really sad. So you can bring them in anyway. You can stomach it. Um, we also get a lot of animals. We get squirrels, rabbits, possums, bobcats, foxes, otters. Um, we got. All of these last year, we had we got to release otters. We had a fox that came from Rockledge that had really bad mange. We got her back to looking beautiful and got her released. Um, and we had some bobcats as well. Uh, we do see raccoons. Um, we have a special enclosure outside that only houses raccoons because of some of the disease that they might be able to carry. You don't want to combine. Um, we, and the funny thing about raccoons is that if you find a baby raccoon, they're like, oh, it's so cute, you gotta save it. But then when we go to try and find a release site, I don't want those in my yard. So you sort of have that dichotomy. They're really adorable when they're babies, but nobody wants them released in their yard. Um, that is one thing that we are always looking for is release sites. It doesn't have to be raccoons. But if people have property, you know, things like bobcats, you just can't release anywhere. Um, so we are always looking for people who have property and are willing to um, let us release some animals. And we even let you select, there's a little application form, and you can select, like, you don't want any raccoons, but sure, what the heck, bring some raccoons along. Um, so that's on our website, so you can apply if you have property or know somebody who has property. Um, we're always looking for new sites. Um, so we see raptors, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, and seabirds, herons, sandhill cranes, things like that. I love this picture. He's like photobombing the picture of the tower for this. So the, the injuries we see, I've already talked about the um, vehicle strikes. We do see a lot of window strikes. Um, that's typically more of the small birds. They don't see the glass. They flush. They run into the window. Um, sometimes it just stuns them a little bit, and they just take a little time to recover. Then we can release them again. Sometimes it causes fractures or head trauma, things like that. So it's best if you can to bring them in. Um, we do get a lot of uh, turtles that were a chew toy for a dog. Um, and then, the, of course, the entanglement with fishing lines, lures, things like that. We see a great variety. We do have weather events that affect our patients. The two weeks after Hurricane Irma, we had 190 baby squirrels come in. So there's a lot of baby squirrel team. Um, we have different winter events. Um, the northern gannets, which are pelagic birds, which who knows what a pelagic bird means? Anybody know what that means? Go ahead, Jenny, you know what it means. Um, except to nap. So if they wash the floor, they're in really pretty bad shape. 
an ambulance, you can, but anyone else not. Okay. Thank you.
you knew, you knew how they ended up here. Yeah. How the race was in. I want to say it was, they were shipped over on harvest. They were introduced on harvest, I think, if I remember correctly. Alright. These are tricky ones even for hospital staff every time they come in. We always have to get booked up to double check. Does anybody know what these two species are? They're fledglings, so they're very small little birds. Um, that's a mockingbird and a European bird. Oh, you are awesome! Very good. Yeah. So, so the mockingbirds are natives, the European fairlings are non natives. Um, one thing with fledglings, just to go over, if you guys ever find a fledgling in your yard, so you find a little baby bird that looks like one of these at the base of your tree, that's completely normal. They will jump out of the nest. 
yourself when we're all finished. You're welcome to take newsletters or any of the handouts that might be helpful. Yeah, and those are the newsletters. Like maybe for baby money and baby mail, these squirrels off, things like that. So, so this next word that we're going to pull out, well, one of the first words we're going to pull out, this is going to be the twin. Twin came to us very, very young. We still like him talking when he came to us. Um, he was actually found with a foot injury. He believes his mom might have dropped him on a phone and fishing line into the net, and it caused a constriction wound all over his right foot. This is Quinn. Quinn is a red shouldered hawk. So you can kind of see as you walk by, Quinn is missing all but one toe on his right foot. Um, red shouldered hawks punch with their feet. Therefore, they catch their prey with their feet. So if you were to release him in the wild, he would struggle very, very much trying to catch his own food. So he came to us um, with that injury since he was so young, and then when he began raised by staff, and he made a wonderful ambassador bird. Red shoulder hawks are very prevalent in this area. You guys might remember last year in the news that there was a red shoulder hawk pair nesting, I think it was off the Lusoto. Yeah, yeah. Um, these guys can be very territorial when they nest. Couple of tricks though, if you do have a territorial pair nesting near you, use an umbrella. They're not going to come under the umbrella to attack you, they might bounce off the umbrella. But we just recommend using caution on small dogs. If you have very small dogs, these guys probably aren't going to attack them, but they might just have a territorial thing, so they're not going to run off with them. A little bit big for that. Um, but they do make protective vests that you can get for your dogs um, that keep away predators. They also deter coyotes, I hear. So you can use that. Um, or just carry the dog with you until you get past the nest. Having to use a wide bird to go around that nest just to give them their space. And then they'll move on. Once the babies are left, they'll be fine. Um, we always, always advocate for you know, the hashtag re nest is best. Um, we always want to try and re nest our patients when they come to us. If we know where the nest is or we know that mom and dad are okay, we will try to take the babies back and put them back in the nest. Um, mom and dad can do much better job, teach stuff for everything they need to know. We can do a good job, we can get it to where it will survive, but they can do it much better. Plus, we will have to use resources and space to get them stuff. So we always try to take them back if we can. That's why knowing where animals came from is so important. Anybody have questions about that? How long do they live, these birds? These guys can live in their 20s. Um, but in the wild, regular hawks usually don't live past very short lifespan in the wild, but in captivity, there are smaller hawk species, so they're okay to move on. I'm noticing that that birds, I had a 
right now is when red bull is going to start building the nest. So we do see it with him, just a natural behavior. He will start the nest sticks that we put in his exhibit and start putting them places. Um, so he drives the nest himself and throws them in too. One, one last question. Uh, what is the um, area the span in, in North America for this bird? Do they go all the way over to Colorado or? I think so, yeah. I think that was pretty much a big North American bird. They they, they got a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I think during Dorian, he 
main part of London life and we can't name our house to name Lieutenant Daniel. <laughs> 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 it's that way in the new volunteer.
bad enough shape that the person, person can walk up and pick it up is in pretty bad shape. So a lot of the animals that come in, I don't care how good of a vet you are, you ain't going to save it. But at least we can ease the suffering and it's not out there, you know, in the heat and getting eaten by an ant. Um, so what we like to look at our numbers is um, if they survive for 24 hours, because that first 24 hours, you know, they're, you know, the, the ones that are in really bad shape aren't in your numbers. Then our numbers were, I don't remember our percentage from last year, but we're more like 50 or 60 percent. Um, that they're good enough that we feel like we can work with them, but it's, it's a fairly new science, and um, we're always learning more things and getting better. We go to a lot of conferences and trainings. Um, because it is a pretty new science. And it's one thing that a lot of people think a vet can do this, and they can't. You actually still have to have a rehab permit um, because it's very different to work with a wild animal that's going to go back in the wild versus a dog or cat. You know, some amputations you can do on a cat. You're not going to be able to do that on a wild animal that's going to be released. So even though it's, there's veterinarians out there, they do have to have a rehab permit in, in order to do rehab work. Now they can do some procedures and work with rehabbers, but they can't do it all on their own and um, release the animals. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm new to this on the Save the Zoo Road. I'm watching it on the God bless you. Okay. <laughs> well, hey, I wanted to ask you about that because um, other people are like, you can't touch it. Yeah, you can. Like, I get right. And I'm yeah. like, Right. And you can bring them to a rehab, too. A lot of people wonder about that. It's illegal to touch them and mess with them. But if you're going to somewhere to get them help, you would not be in trouble for that. Yeah. 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 Pointed in the direction they were going. Right. right. <laughs> Always point in the direction that they were going. Otherwise, they're going to turn back around and try again. Yeah. Some very stubborn creatures. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, here we are. Who's here? After just having a wonderful presentation by the Florida Wildlife Hospital and Sanctuary, that was great and informative. Um, I'd like to open the floor up for staff updates. Hello, board. All right, we're going to start with our uh, informational items. Uh, we have the number one is the composting workshop that was scheduled for December 14th at the community garden. Uh, was canceled. Jennifer, I know we worked on that a lot. We're going to hopefully reschedule that for Earth Day, April 25th. You can combine it with Earth Day and work together on that if, if you like the idea. Um, it was unfortunate. I, I apologize for the personal uh, issue that took me away from the event, and we'll make sure that we can reschedule it. If, if the board likes the Earth Day event, we can reschedule it for coinciding with the Earth Day and having it be a workshop that's part of the event to try to combine events like we were talking about mm -hmm. so we can be more sustainable with more potent events and not having too many okay. events. Uh, that's my recommendation for that. Mm -hmm. uh, the working group, as far as sustainability working group, proposed a date for the summit. We had our date we agreed on last time, and that took that to the Bovard Sustainability Working Group before the holiday. They reviewed it, went over it, and came back with another date for the Sustainability Summit of March 23rd at the Bovard Zoo from 5.30 to 8.30. I want to, again, thank the board for coming up with the first date and bringing that to them, and apologize that, you know, that that wasn't available, and that the Bovard Sustainability Working Group wants to kind of take the reins of the event, and as that was the idea of the first Sustainability Summit was to create a functional model for others to run. They'll help run that. Uh, and that is tentatively scheduled for March 23rd at the Bavard Zoo from 5.30 to 8.30. The grant application for the Gale Meredith Seaside Forest that we planted right here in front of City Hall uh, was submitted to keep Bavard beautiful. They'll announce that in March, so fingers crossed. Hopefully we come back with a grant award with that project. The next thing, um, Lexi, Ms. Miller, would you like to continue? 
Uh, the solar light installation for DeSoto was completed uh, earlier this month. It actually looked really nice if you haven't had a chance to run by it. It's, um, it's, it's pretty nicely lit. Uh, there is one pole that belongs to FPL that's not part of the project that's out currently, um, but I let Alan, the Public Works Director, know. Um, so hopefully that will be lit up a little bit more and our parking lot will have a little bit more lighting. But it's pretty cool. I'm working on um, we have a monitoring system in place for it, and it's an administrative login accessible, but it's not necessarily uh, like website ready. So I'm working on getting that to be more display friendly so that people can maybe check on the website or we can find a home for that information, kind of like a real-time data feed, just like the one out in the lobby for the panels on top of City Hall. All right, thank you. And today, we had a wonderful event out in front of City Hall but at 8.30. Until noon, we had the students from Surfside Elementary, the gifted students came over from all their grade levels, and they held the first youth summit, youth environmental summit, right here at our city hall. Uh, smashing success, we had eight different tablers, the kids got to participate in a variety of activities, and we're looking at doing these again in the future. So far, so good. Um, so hopefully we can keep that up. Some future events is the next section. and. Uh, there's a couple of these, so I want to keep everybody aware of what's happening and invite you to participate as much as possible in these future events. The first one is February 7th from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. It's the Sustainable Florida Forum. It's going to be held at the Global Collaboration Building at UCF. Address is 4356 Scorpus Street, and I think I said that right, in Orlando. And that is the, it'll be the second time that I'll attend this event. It's an event designed to discuss sustainable activities in different communities and how we can collaborate and reach the, the goals of sustainability together, uh, discussing how we can create a more sustainable future. So board members, please, you're all invited to, to go. I'll be driving up there, so if you want to carpool, let me know. We can all head up there together. It's a little expensive, but I think well worth it based on the experience that we had in years past. So hopefully you'll be able to join and attend that one. Shortly after that, on February 8th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., the Florida Friendly Landscaping Seminar will take place. This was an event uh, that we've been taking part of for the past couple of years. We held it here at Satellite at uh, the Satellite High School previously. And after that, it was at O'Galley. And again, we're going to do the O'Galley location, the different Sponsors and members of the event, all the partners decided to redo it at the same location in O'Galley at the O'Galley High School at 1400 Town Road Boulevard because of the great attendance that we've had. And there's already been 200 people that signed up on Eventbrite for the event. Um, you know, there'll be raffle prizes and some different vendors that are kind of geared towards that event. If you're interested, uh, please let me know. There's different ways you can help out and volunteer to stuff envelopes. There's different things you can do just to be there and get educated about for friendly landscaping. Some really great uh, speakers going to be there this year. The next is a, a combination of dates for the locals only surf fest on February 8th and 9th. Uh, this will be held at Pelican Beach Park. So since it coincides with the event on February 8th, I won't be able to be there to table it on the 8th, but I will be there on the 9th to help table. And if anybody wants to help table on the 9th up at Pelican Park to do the surf fest, please let me know. Happy to have some involvement from the board, whether it's just helping table, interact with the community, talking about projects with the community. That'd be fantastic. So you're all invited to attend. And on Saturday, February 22nd, the Samson's Island Open House from 9.30 to 2 p.m. Uh, this is a really great one for board involvement. Samson's Island is, of course, one of our, our cherished parks, the 52-acre nature park, and we'll be having our general table with general information about sustainability and how people can be involved and attend our meetings. And if you want to be there to help, uh, that'd be great. There's always a big need that the rec center has. If you want to contact Jacqueline Bleacher, uh, go ahead and get uh, in contact with her. I have her email there on the page there for you. Um, she'll be more than happy to give you a volunteer position, whether it's helping set up breakdown or make sandwiches or whatever they have going on uh, that day. Most importantly, next is the Arbor Day event uh, on April 24th. I think combining this with the Gail Meredith project would be really fantastic if we could get that grant and plant the plants on Arbor Day on April 24th. That would be fantastic. That's one day before Earth Day. 
I know that's a whole other topic, and we're going to get to talk about Earth Day in the future and setting that up. Um, I've already talked to our board chair about that specifically, going over some details and bringing that back to the board at a future meeting. Uh, so that's all I have for our staff report today. Just a lot of updates on activities and things to be involved with. And of course, at the bottom is our community meetings at a glance table, where you'll see all the different things that you can attend and be involved with or just uh, ask me questions about. I'll be happy to inform you about the things going on with the different groups in the community. I uh, did have two things happen today uh, in addition to the report that was, uh, that was written. Uh, one of them is the Wicked Pineapple has offered to name a bowl after our sustainability board to create a sustainability board bowl with the, with the group. I know it's, it's a little different, but uh, Brian over there said, you know, if we want to come up with some flavors and different combinations of granola and coconut that the board wants to call the SD bowl or sustainability bowl, we can submit it to him and he'll put it up on his uh, board of different options, uh, which is really nice of him. Uh, other than that, um, I don't know if all of you have heard that, uh, unfortunately, uh, Brevard Solar recently uh, closed their doors. So uh, we're working on trying to see what that's going to change in the community. There might be a few community members that have solar that was halfway installed. Um, talked to a few different solar distributors and trying to get them in touch with people to help them out. But uh, if you know anybody in that situation, tell them to hopefully, you know, look at other options and, and you know, okay. there's plenty of resources out there. Courtney yeah. and Carl, a thing that lists uh, the winner of the last Space Coast Solar Co-op, three guys, mm. is offered to step in for folks in the city. And uh, there's contact information. Also, I... Uh, Folks with the to do the co-op, the solar, or the solar neighbor, United, 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 United Solar United Neighbors, I guess it is, uh, sent an email that I forwarded that uh, identifies. Uh, I think it's Mogan Muns and Muns or whatever. In other words, if somebody is putting money, mm. you don't, you know, apparently that's. On a bankruptcy filing, there's an attorney that's handling those claims. Yeah, and so that's there. Uh, yeah, it would probably be nice. If, and it might be the people that had orders, and, and according to the folks in the building department, there are at least two that haven't, mm -hmm. they haven't closed the, the permit. So presumably there may be some anxiety there reaching out. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. And and. The other thing that the there's one person who put a thirteen thousand dollar down payment. With okay. No, they haven't filed for a permit yet. So yeah. So that's, that's that's the sad. That's hard. Story. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is that if you go back, like uh, Brevard Solar put in my first, uh, which that was fine. Uh, the thing is, you might want to go back and see all the folks that have had Brevard Solar and let the, and basically send them what the gal sent me that talks about the. Uh, There's three warranties, basically, when there's an installation and the re relationship among them. And uh, I presume then the other thing, like if you need to have a new roof put on, somebody's got to come in and take it off. And usually you think about the installer. If the installer's not there, then it uh, sounds like three guys may be, but probably most anybody else. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of a sticky wicket because... Uh, mm -hmm. That was kind of unexpected. Thanks, John. Thanks. Uh, any, any questions about the staff update and staff report? Um, I'm wondering about the Brevard uh, Sustainability Working Group. So they're doing the March 23rd, um, and they want to create a model, you said, for future events. You talk about annual events. Like, what, what thoughts, ideas, what are they sort of envisioning? Okay. Um, so I'll try to be a little bit clear as possible. The, sure, yeah. We created kind of the model for the Sustainability Summit <laughs> previously. 
they're going to take that model. They're going to they're going to work on that for this next one. Uh, for other events that they're working on, it's all geared towards sustainability boards, right? whether it's the uh, Sustainability Board, the Beautification and Energy Efficiency Board in Melbourne, and getting those individuals like yourselves educated about different topics, whatever that topic might be. We partnered with them for the uh, solar workshop at FSAC. That was you know great, and and you know having people come up to that geared towards individuals like yourselves. So in the future, if there's a topic that you think that that board should focus on, you know, I'll bring that to the, the monthly meetings, and the next event will focus on that. And there'll be some things that they're going to cover at the summit is what do the board individuals want to learn about? What are the types of things that you, as, as board members, you know, want to know? Because by empowering you with information, you then help empower, empower the community, right? right? right. Um, so right now, it's just the summit. Um, and, and kind of working together on what that's going to look like. Right. Um, the next event we haven't decided. Okay, but it sounds like board coordination, support, and education. Absolutely. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I know Earth Day was a big part of the early discussions because it's like coming up right after that. So mm -hmm. I mean, that's well, I think with with them taking that on, that allowed yeah. us to focus on Earth Day, which mm -hmm. is, is great. Sure, but they had a big focus on like so many people are doing the same things in April, and that's just a tangible example of coordination, support, and education for boards. Mm -hmm. And so, just yeah, I wondered if they mentioned that in terms of you know, because it's always that nice to have a focal object mm -hmm. when you're talking about how do you coordinate, how do you support, how do you educate. And I wondered if they were going oh, with that. Oh, that's a great idea. So, we can talk about coordinating Earth Day at right. the summit right. and see what other cities are doing. Right, 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 right. right. That was kind of like it's a really good idea. Yeah. I'll make sure that we make that a focus of the of it with the members. I think we briefly mentioned it, so it might be like, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, well, yeah. I, we did talk with them, like, so Sarah at the Zoo, yeah. the Sustainability Coordinator at the Zoo, right. she's one of the people that is mm -hmm. chairing the Department of Sustainable Working Group. Her event is on the 15th, so we're kind of coordinating things that don't overlap, right. which is mm -hmm. nice. Right. So that I, we can you know, have them at our event, and then we're not stepping right. on other events. Right. Unfortunately, FSEC is having uh, a, a Events on the same day as our Earth Day, but you know, it would be cool if Brevard Working Group sent out a press release with all the events going on. Mm -hmm. So it was published in like the Florida Today, yeah. and yeah. uh, countywide Earth Day celebrations and mm -hmm. all the yeah, yeah. I just remember how many <coughs> concurrent things were happening mm -hmm. that yeah. weekend. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. to, yeah, yeah, which I wanted to go to. Too. I mean, just hard, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. So. Those are both great. That's great. Any other any other great board member comments? <laughs> well, I don't know if this is great, but I was just curious with the youth summit. Was that open to like the public or was that just internal for Surfside? Was that like Surfside? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Surfside gets the students learn. specifically. Okay. Lucy Eric Mara is the, the yeah, teacher, yeah. teacher over there. And, yeah. You know, she's been great to work with from yeah. day one and this was kind of her idea and it took off and mm -hmm. we had a bunch of partners show up at eight different vendors. It was it was really great. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. That's all I got. I just have one real, real quick. Um, we had a, I had a meeting with um, a council member from Titusville who was wanting to get an idea of what you all were doing. Um, and she might want to invite one of you to go present to their commission and their council about what we're doing. So if that's something that you'd be willing to do, I'll let her know that. I told her I'd ask first before. <laughs> <Can> <laughs> <I do? laughs> but she, they, it's, it's, it, it is interesting to see how many people do schedule meetings with us to figure out how to, you know, kind of mimic what we're doing over here. So. Probably, is, probably is important. It's not what we're doing, but the process by which we're operating, which is basically if you're into bicycles, then you start a <laughs> bicycle thing and, you know, that kind of thing. Or if you're into solar, then you do stuff there. That it's kind of the board is concentrating on things that people become champions for. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, John, related to you, though, I also feel like your, um, your <coughs> sense of the history of this, I think, would be an important thing to talk about because I mean, I don't have that history at all, and I feel like that, though, is how the board has gotten to this place. And I'm clearly, you know, you're on and on going where you grapple with different things, like, okay, how are we going to manage, or, you know, define this, that, and the other. But um, that's what I'm still curious about, is just catching up on the history of the developmental trajectory of how 
this board came to be, because what's happening today is a product of that, but it doesn't look like, I'm guessing, what it did 10 years ago. But all these little okay, things. Uh, that, that's the point, because actually uh, Courtney and I are on a board with a base that's been active for 15 or 20 years now. I'm one of, I think it's two remaining charter members, and it's very clear that that history has been lost. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the meeting next week is going to represent the charter and the, you know, so that we can get back to basics. Right. <laughs> it's been hijacked. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we, okay, I'll, I'll, somebody may, may need to ping me once in a while, but I guess I'll try to take that on the, mm -hmm. at least bullet points. All right, so uh, any, well, do you want to, do, what date was she thinking on having one of us come? Um, I told her I'd ask to see if you'd be willing to do that first, and then I'll coordinate with you and her. Because we're getting, to, um, and March is going to be, I mean, do you want to try to put something together by next month, to, or presentation, or something, bullet points? Yeah, I can I can work on that. If it doesn't work, then I'll <clears throat> we can slip it, but I can target that. And I think I might have a presentation about this board that I've done in the past that I can send you yeah, as I, a way to you know so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Okay. And you can just add to it or change whatever you want. Um, yeah, because we we get invited to speak about this a lot in mm -hmm. professional you know associations and stuff like that. So. What I always like to hear about, in, like in understanding the development of, of groups and organizations, is like, what challenges did they face at certain times? Like, it, it's always contingent on what's happening in the community, like 10 mm -hmm. years ago. And then what threats have been maintained? Like, what kinds of things were, have, we're still talking about? And um, what are the things that have always really worked in terms of having the um, the flexibility to brainstorm and to have interest be brought versus what things don't tend to work. Like, I guess it's like laymen's kind of talking about like how a, how a group, you know, and so whatever this group does successfully may not work for a different right. group. But that's, that's been a challenge, I think. Yeah. You have, um, in our city, we've always had a very, it, it ends with the council. So if the council has doesn't support it, or doesn't support it all the way, you know, it's harder to get things done and harder to move things forward. And then I, I have to explain that to a lot of the council members who are, are having a hard time because they're in the minority. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the council isn't wanting to do what we do. And so we've enjoyed a 5-0 support for everything that we bring to them, um, whereas other cities just don't have that, you know, luxury. So that. That is the number one. When people ask me why are we so successful, I say that's what I say: mm -hmm. is that the council members uh, have supported the board since day one, and you know whatever the board wants, they basically do it. So um, if we didn't have that council support, we wouldn't be where we are today. Well, that's that's a point that I I think the history I would write mm -hmm. would go back to the starting of the city in the 50s because that has been this building is here because of an ad hoc committee. This board is here because of an ad hoc committee. And that goes all the way back, basically, to the beginning. Mm -hmm. Everything that the city has accomplished um, has been because of the dedication of a volunteer group that started meeting. That, that's literally where everything started, from what I can see. Yep. So it's, it is. It's part of the culture of the city, which mm -hmm. can make it hard for other communities to, to repeat that. And some cities are having a hard time populating their boards right now. And then, you know, it, and it's also, too, you know, once community members see that the board's not doing anything because it's not got, it doesn't have the political support, they won't get members, you know, because people will fall out. So, and, you know, and I think some of the cities started, at, you know, the sustainability board because there's a competitive nature between cities, you know, and then also that, they, you know, they're hearing that their community wants them, but those particular council members don't fully support it. And so if that, that's the case, then, you know, I tell them, like, we just need to start working on educating and convincing 
instead of bringing full-scale initiatives to them, you know, instead of do workshops to educate them about, you know, certain initiatives. Like, they, if they want to do solar, you know, I, would, I told her I would go get hundreds of examples of other cities that have done it and that it's a cost-effective, you know, focus on the cost and the business aspect of it, um, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, all of these boards are having some initial success and some are, you know, waffling. So if they don't have the staff support either, sometimes the city managers don't really want to do it, you know, so it's different, um, different everywhere. But I think it's a good step that they want to get examples from us, you know, and, and I think that's a good opportunity to show people that we, you know, um, we wanted to put solar on a building, we did it, you know, we wanted to do this, we did it, so, you know. Um, and I think it's better for you guys to do these presentations and not like say name in it because it's you know um, better to get you guys out there. They want to hear from the board member. You know, they hear from me all the time. <laughs> so. uh, backing up, what's the date for when you would be talking about this board? Oh, to that group? To whatever group? I don't know yet. We're we're going to schedule it when we get. Okay, that that wasn't part of what Nick was talking about. The, no. uh, okay, okay, okay. No, this is just Titusville's wanting some advice. Yeah. Are you available next Thursday? I'll have to go home and look at my. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm very interested in getting into uh, prison presenting mm -hmm. this type stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd like to go over it pretty thoroughly yeah. with John. Okay. And, uh, maybe that uh, history that we're able to get down on paper, we can pass to everyone. Mm -hmm. Everybody can be on the same page. Yeah. It would be great to do a dry run, just, I mean, for my own education. <laughs> just to kind of, yeah. And I think if you, if we had a, a presentation that we keep updated, that so when we mm -hmm. get a request, we can just call you guys and whoever's available can go out and do it. Absolutely. Um, that would be helpful. Because we do get those requests, you know, every now and then. Yeah, I think it would be great for everybody. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, any further public comment? Okay. No? All right. Next order of business. Um, we've got discuss, take action on commercial landscaping, land development regulations. Um, this is something that you wanted to take Yeah. Uh, I won't go into the details. I did uh, have Julie uh, send out a uh, piece of paper trying to outline uh, the code in a nutshell satellite beaches code today is prescriptive for every 2,000 square feet on your property you're going to have at least one tree or five and five shrubs and you can substitute up uh, three palm trees for each required tree okay that's the way it is if it's a lot like ours, which is 90 feet by 100 feet, or if it's Atlantic Class at 13 acres, it's the same rule. <clears throat> and uh, I'd gotten to think about it through a series of events. So I used an example here, uh, which I thought might, most people might understand. I think everybody's kind of familiar with the, uh, the old bowling alley lot. 200 feet wide, 800 feet deep. It's, uh, uh, let's see, how big, uh, yeah, 3.8 acres. And so when you do the numbers, and I did round down instead of up, uh, it says that uh, you should have 82 trees and 413 shrubs. And half of each of those is supposed to be between the building and the street, which means in 200 feet, you're going to try to place 41 trees. That's a tree every five feet. And if you've got driveways and things, it scrunches them up a little more. And 270 shrub, 207 shrubs, which means that's better than one shrub for every front foot. And uh, that seems a little excessive uh, in my mind, anyway. And I talked to Courtney some, and, and uh, uh, 
she kind of came up with what's probably the basic question. What purpose is landscape serving? Okay, we all think about, well, we want it to look nice. But then there's shading issues. Uh, good tree canopy will absorb a lot of rainfall. My experience has been the first quarter inch may not hit the ground if you've got heavy canopy. So that if you're having those brief afternoon showers, the ground under a tree might not even get wet. It gets on the leaves and then evaporates. Uh, and then I had a whole list of questions. What plants do well here? What don't do well? We have a list that's in the code. Uh, I know I haven't paid attention to that since it was published, so I don't know what the success rate has been. Uh, how much of that landscape do we want to be? Do we want to be native and why? And basically going instead of a prescriptive trying to design what I guess you'd call a functional code, not to replace. I would think we could leave the code where it is. If it needs adjusting, you can adjust it. But to come up with a parallel, just like I believe the way the code is, the way it was some years ago, they say, here's how you build a foundation for a slab on grade. You know, it's one foot deep, one foot wide, so many some number of bars every so far or so on. Or you can have an auditor design that comes in signed off by a licensed engineer. And so the one's prescriptive. Here's the way you do it. And the other one says if you've got another idea, as long as somebody will buy off on it. And so my thought was it might be useful to have a group of folks, and I would expect it would be folks that kind of are aware of plants, isn't just, you know, anybody off the street, might want to go through the, through the code and also think about why is it there and what do we want to, you know, how do we make that happen? And uh, see where it goes. Who would go through this? Um, John, it sounds like you have a lot of time on your hands. <laughs> Give me too much time, but I appreciate it because I love that concept of, of doing this because we know who, who thinks of this and who goes out there and really, you know, does the research, but you're absolutely right. And so, I mean, I, I'd like to volunteer and help in any way that I can. Well, I would, I would think the beautification board probably is a, a natural, and there's folks here uh, I don't know. I'd find it convenient, at least at the start, maybe, just to kind of have it, in, in other words, not a formal subcommittee or something, just you know, a, a group of folks that get together. I know my wife would love to get involved with that and stuff, or, or do you see that as a problem as a beginning? No, I think you need to keep it at the board. Okay. But, but that's, so, so what I would recommend is we would come in and do a presentation on the possible purpose and goals of landscape codes so um, the board can give us some high level deck, you know, direction on how, what you want included. And so like, for example, like just possibilities that other communities have done. Because I saw an opportunity when I was, you know, talking with John, I don't, um, the number of landscaping requirements has never really been a problem for, for new construction, you know, and with old, you know, older renovation areas, we just retrofit the code, you know, to make it as best as we can. But um, when you have a new construction scenario, we normally can get all that landscaping in. What our code is missing, though, is opportunities to require depressed landscaping islands you know, in the parking areas that would capture stormwater rather than roll it off. Um, so those are, you know, that's a, so, you know, we can use our landscaping code to incorporate stormwater goals and objectives. Um, for example, if you have a swale, um, we can maybe ask, say, you know, you can reduce, you know, your tree canopy requirements, you know, 
by 20% if you put in nutrient reducing plant material in the swales, you know, stuff like that. So some of those incentives to get them to do other, because that is a lot more maintenance heavy when you do those types of, um, so that's a trade off. The other thing is, you know, when we look at the plant list, the one thing that I, I have, I don't know if you've encountered it, but um, when we have a limited plant list, sometimes the developers have a hard time finding the plants. Like if a nursery isn't carrying what, you know, they need at that moment. So you'll see a lot of times in the communities, particularly in the same time period, the same trees going in because one nursery has it all, you know. Um, so if we could expand that to make, to, to be, um, broader, um, so that we can, so developers can comply easier. Yeah. That would that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, so those are some of the you know just opportunities that I saw with the code. You know, if we require all native and then just get rid of the requirements for irrigation, you know, that's another opportunity, um, which nobody fights us on because they don't want to pay for irrigation anyway. Um, they. But yeah. there, there, there can be a problem if you don't require, because uh, one of the problems that uh, we've encountered over the last year, uh, again at Taco Bell, uh, they had no irrigation. And so what was happening, the landscaper wasn't coming often enough. And so the staff was expected to go out with buckets of water and work, and it just doesn't hack it. It doesn't work. It doesn't, you know, it just isn't practical. Well, that's, unfortunately, like, we can't fix I a management problem, you know. So if that yeah. manager isn't requiring the landscaping to, you know, to honor their contract, that's that's their issue, you know, not not necessarily a subject matter for us to deal with. But, but yeah, you know, you have to have an establishment period. Um, and, you know, normally you just hire water trucks to come out and do that. Um, but the um, oh, the other thing is shade. So we talked about that. So with climate change, you know, not some of our um, you know staff members are going to talk about climate change in a little bit. Um, when we designed or when we approved the design for the public works building and the fire station, we shoved a lot of trees up towards the sidewalk so that they will canopy over. So it provides shade for the pedestrian. Um, so that's one of the goals that we could also do. So if we come up with we come up with a standard, and there's plenty of cities that already have this, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. But you come up with a standard of planting from the sidewalk so that the roots don't interfere and stuff like that. But it still gets that shade over the sidewalk for the pedestrian, and that's why we actually load up the landscaping towards the front is really for that tree canopy. Mm -hmm. I want to start with the idea of why we're doing landscaping. If you go to the purpose of the article, I'm Carl Martin, I'm with the building department. Um, if you go to the purpose of the article, it explains a lot of what they were trying to do when they developed our landscaping. If you go through, it talks about reduced flood hazards, uh, shade, all these good things, you know, pollutants. Um, it might be a good place for you to start and look at what we're looking at, what you guys, what you folks think you should you do with commercial landscaping. So. So we could probably do that with the do a presentation on the code that we have now, correct? And explain it and kind of give some examples of recent developments, maybe so you can see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, like the end result, I think that would be good. Oceano would be a good example. Correct. I mean, they have five acres there, and half of it's in the ocean, and they were able to accomplish their their the quantities they needed for trees and shrubs, and there's a lot of pavement out there as well. So, but yeah, you know, if you look at the purpose of the article. Um, it, it might be a good place to start. So that's just right. So. How, how long do you think this discussion would take? I mean, to, to uh, redesign this this code. Well, for you all, it depends on how much you want to get in, you know, changed. Um, so we can present the code, some possibilities, some of the things that we think it lacks, and you know, something that we, you know, any recommendations, um, and then. It'll probably take you a couple of meetings to go through that. I'm, I'm just off the top of my head, I'm thinking half a year. Yeah. Even. It's, it's not a crisis that has to be solved tomorrow. No, it can take time. Yeah, it's a great project. And then, you know, and then after that, it would go to the beautification board. And then they would, they would probably do more of the 
technical, you know, plant types and stuff like that. Um, and then it has to go to an ordinance, mm -hmm. and then that goes to PNZ or PAB. PAB. You can't, what can we call it? PNZ. I still complain about that. Yeah, Every sorry, other city is PNZ, but ours is PAB. <laughs> um, so it would go to the PAB, and then it would go to city council for two readings. So it could easily take a year, easily. And I've seen them take two, three years to do something like this. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Anything else? Um, we have a public comment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Please. Oh, please. Please come to the podium. That's what I thought. Oh. Right here, and she's right there. Yeah. Oh, I didn't. I was, I was like, oh, I didn't. Yeah, get up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. Do I welcome you to your little stand out? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because she was talking so much in the presentation. I was like, she's like right. part of the presentation. I had no idea. And so she goes, she goes, it's Jenny White. And I said, isn't that her right there? She goes, no. And I'm like, okay. I do. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, I think it's her. And I'm like, should have had, like, a, a gen, like, spiritual connection. But I did it. I'm so sorry. Hi, Jenny. You I knew. <laughs> That's so funny. Because I, I knew. I'm like, yeah, I know. That was my bad. I was just like, why? Oh, so sorry for I just had a quick question um, about that. Uh, who would we, because I'm brand new, if we had ideas on that, who would we send that to then? If you guys have ideas, send it to Nick, and we will compile them into the mm -hmm. presentation. And, you know, yeah, that would be good. And uh, Carl, I'm going to correct me if I'm wrong. It's 3072. Is that right? Because of the code? 3701. So if you want to look at the code in the municipal code itself, that gives a good idea of the different plant lists and the definitions and everything. Just go ahead and start there municipal code. You can get them right to the city website. It's really easy to get to. The plant lists are, are broken down into tree types and shrubs, and it's, it's really easy to kind of to read. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. but, but it's in tables. Not, and a lot of these trees, we don't know if they're native. They're broken down into the native. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that kind of thing. I think it's 50% requirement for for native? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 50% to be considered for So that's the other thing is you might want to up that ante, mm -hmm. you know, so those are opportunities too. Yeah. And does that include substrate that you're using below the planting soil? Um, not in that code. It's, does that code include substrate? I don't think it includes any substrate material. It just is focused on trees and shrubs. On shrubs, yeah. I mean, that might be something to look at too, the whole process is this is a lot here. Yeah. Well, I, I recall as part of the uh, committee on the fire station uh, public works, uh, public works really was interested in having an easy to maintain landscape. And I can sympathize with the commercial people too, you know, they want the same thing. And uh, uh, talking with the guy there at Taco Bell, I hadn't realized, but somewhere, I don't think it's in the city code, uh, folks don't like shrubs or trees growing up against the building. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got something that's planted too close to the building, then somebody has to go in and start trimming the back side of it, you know, there's just, or things grow up into the soffits. You know, there's just all kinds of these issues uh, that uh, the city can't be a nanny state that tries to avoid every potential problem there is, but it'd be nice to steer people away from the obvious problems anywhere, like planting live oaks under power lines, let's say. Well, yeah. we do that now. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that we look at when we do reviews. But, but I, I would just be careful, and you know, because we do development review and you know, code enforcement and dealing with commercial developers and real and residential developers every day. And I can tell you that they all complain about the cost of the landscaping, having to do the maintenance. So if so, I would be cautious, you know, because everything you just talked about. Is literally daily maintenance of the landscaping, and if, they, if that's just some 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 people just don't want to pay for that. Um, but that's you know, you're making a decision between not having any landscaping and 
you know, somebody having to maintain it. So you just you've got to be careful about um, how much do we move over to that side of decreasing their costs because it does make a visual impact and difference to the city. But again, one of the things I notice in this, I primarily notice down at Doubles that to get in all the shrubs they needed to do, they were planting, planting, you know, things that I expect are going to grow to like three feet tall that far apart. So it's too close. Some of that's done for screening purposes, right. though. Mm -hmm. yeah. Residential, yeah. So that was done at the request of the adjacent homeowners. So it's, it's done purposely so it screens that there is a visual barrier mm -hmm. of landscaping. So some of that stuff is done purposely to, to create a screening barrier. Okay. Of the adjacent yeah. Our experience has been in our landscape and other landscapes. If you get the shrubs too close together, you get problems with white flies, mealy bugs. There's all kinds of things that like it in that dense lack of air circulation environment. And so, uh, anyway, there's there's a whole bunch of issues. Landscape professional design landscaping, and they're they're designed for that type of But I think also, like, you know, um, maintaining for pest control and stuff like that, that's all part of their maintenance requirements, you know, that they have to deal with. Because, I mean, we can't, in those instances, you're, we're trying to shield residential property owners from a commercial activity, especially when with a drive through So that was, you know, that's the, you know, um, goal of that. And if they, if Doubles has to go in and, you know, spray and maintain that, that's their responsibility. So, and, you know, I, I hear maintenance complaints every day. You know, because, I mean, I'll tell you right now, my public works people, that's the first thing they think of any time you ask them, hey, we're going to do this project. What's it going to be for maintenance? You know, what are I going to maintain? You know, because that's, you know, anytime you add on to it, it, it makes it harder for them. So, but we're not going to not do the project, <laughs> you know. So that's the difference. Mm -hmm. I think we got to be careful of what we're taking out of the code to make people. Yeah, there's a balance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Well, I think this is a great idea and project. What, just for clarification, what's going to be our next step? What can we look forward to for the next month's meeting? Do you think? So I think for the next month, what we'll do is a presentation to you about mm -hmm. this current code and put in a lot of ideas from other cities that, that we don't have. And, and if you all have some that you know of that you would like to include in that, just email it to us and we'll put it in the presentation. And that kind of kicks off your, um, you know, discussion. Cool. Can we go ahead and add that to uh, uh, agenda, agenda items already? Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool, cool. All right. Is there any further public comment? No? All right. Next order of business. Uh, discuss take action on expanding the scope of recycling involvement by City of Satellite Beach beyond residential and commercial recycling. Yeah. Uh, I read a couple books that were really enlightening and basically even with all the recycling that's done in this country and Europe and other places, there is an absolutely huge amount of stuff that goes in landfills or elsewhere. Uh, <clears throat> and if you really think about it, if you had the proper infrastructure. There's virtually nothing that we get rid of that couldn't have another life. Like up there at the 27 acres, they had all kinds of streets and stuff. They tore it up and broke it up, 
and it's disappearing, I presume, as aggregate used in concrete or in roads or something like that. Uh, if nothing else, if it has available BTUs, you can burn it and use it for fuel to run to generate electricity, which I'm not thinking is the best use, but anyway. Uh, or you can char it and make charcoal out of it and use that to regenerate the soil. Uh, that is really a good way to improve the soil. Uh, and there's a lot of things uh, that you can reuse instead of recycle. Uh, one use plastic bags is one. Uh, my wife and I collect them. Uh, that's what I use to get rid of cat litter, all kinds of things. Uh, reading cards, we have a, a bucket up at the Schechter Center. We get them and they get sorted out. There's a surprising number of those cards that have never been marked on. Mm -hmm. Those can literally be reused. My wife knows people that, you know, homebound or whatever, that they get to use those. Uh, and you can ask people to send a selfie. Mm -hmm. You can ask people to send a selfie instead. <laughs> and I didn't bring it, but uh, we, my wife cuts them up into things that I carry in my pocket for taking notes. Uh, I think I do have one in there now. Uh, she cuts them up into three by five and makes her own three by five cars. She's got, uh, there's all kinds of things you can do with things. And uh, uh, the, the idea gets to the idea of a circular economy. Right now, ours is an open-ended economy. The Chinese take resources from Australia or wherever, turn them into goods. They're shipped here. We buy them. We use them for whatever period of time, either once or for a while. And then we put it in the trash. We either recycle it or put it in the trash, but recycling it, it it's just amazing. Uh, they went through, like, goodwill. They get all this clothing and stuff. Only a small part of it gets sold. The rest of it goes out. There are companies in Canada that actually take it and tear it into fibers, which then go somewhere and are made into something else. But uh, large amounts of stuff just go, like if it's soiled, into the trash. And uh, so there's all this business, and they use the example of automobiles. After World War II, People had cars and stuff, and, and so there was a problem with cars being left all over the place. That's when the auto junkyards got started. Uh, but it turned out a lot of the major, the major manufacturers would provide the manuals and the equipment to repair cars only to their dealers. So Seaside Auto up there by the uh, uh, Pineda, they would not be able to work on the cars because they had neither the manuals nor the equipment needed to do it. And uh, eventually, it was in the 60s or 70s somewhere, uh, some pressure was brought to bear because I believe it was Massachusetts was passing and going to pass a law that said you can't sell a car in this state unless people can repair it and stuff. And so uh, some organizations got together, put pressure to bear, and now anybody can buy at fair market value the manuals and, and the equipment. And so uh, uh, <clears throat> we're seeing that with electronics now. You can't repair it for the most part. There are two models. You take Apple, and uh, according to one of the books, if they've got screws to get into it, they'll put a special head on it that you can't take your Phillips or one of the others, the Hex or something else. You need their special funny screwdriver to get it open. Uh, Seems like a multifaceted problem where, I mean, this is one of the reasons I'm interested in compost, because it's so multifaceted. It's, it's like 
How do you attack it? And I actually lived in uh, four different countries in Europe, and um, the model there is completely different that uh, it just wouldn't even work in America at this point because um, in most European countries, unless you do what you're told in the municipality, it doesn't get picked up. So you have a bucket that is compost, and if you were to throw food in your regular trash, they won't pick it up. Mm -hmm. It's up to you then to find out how to dispose of that. Um, I mean, everything is sorted. You have colors for everything. Every day of the week is something different that's being picked up. And here in America, people, is, they're not being told what to do yet, so they're not going to do it. Part of the problem, too, is though, that waste management has no place to take the stuff to, you know, the Chinese blocked off. Uh, is it Thailand or someplace I was reading recently said, no, Malaysia, I think. It was being, stuff was being diverted there, and they said, we don't want it, and they're sending those shipping containers back to the country of origin. Uh, so there, there is a problem, and it's beyond the ability of the city to solve it. That's recognizable. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know whether there might be some interest in trying to, uh, I'll say, network with other folks, uh, either on the county level, state level, or just trying to, like this sustainability board started something other communities are picking up on. The city got involved with uh, sea level rise, and we've kind of become a model, is trying yeah. to... There's several different principles that are being used right now in sustainable development um, where they're focusing on certain things like that. But again, you have to lead toward you're basically not giving the citizens that option anymore. So that's the way things get changed, and people are so easily, e easily adaptable to the change when they don't have an option. Um, so I know what um, Europe started with in order to phase out all these countries that don't even use plastic bags anymore. Um, they started with uh, first in local provinces, which would be like counties, um, you have to pay if you need a bag. And so, you know, no one wants to pay an extra five, six bucks for those bags, they bring their own. And eventually then the community can say, we, it's not cost effective for us to even carry these anymore. So then it's phased out. So I think that, you know, if you're wanting to do something along those lines like that, you have to pick, pick baby steps and then be able to focus on something. And you're talking about the things that can, you can do something about. Correct. So there's some things where there's no home for it um, or you lack the capability of repurposing it somehow, which we haven't solved. But things like composting, things like, you know, recycling or not using plastic bags, all those things can help. Um, I think it seems so multi I said it's multifaceted because there's I there's ways to get at it, but right there's no requirement. Right, and there's amazing. I mean, there's so much going on right now. I mean, this whole entire. Um, I'm actually taking a class right now on it, and maybe why I know a little bit about it. But yeah, there's these great new movements that are coming up that um, are uh, helping regulatory processes. That are the regulatory processes are changing right now, so uh, all over the country, globally, but uh, really in America right now. Yeah. So there are cities that are really doing some big changes already. I'm not sure what the issue. I mean, this is like, yeah. <laughs> this is like this is yeah. out of yeah. control okay. because. We get picked up, you know, twice a week for just regular garbage. My recyclable is full. Every, you know, you know, I use a lot of recyclables apparently. But um, it's it, it's crazy. But the other two days, they're not really full at all. I'm not really having maybe one bag of garbage for a family of five because we're composting or we can, you know, distributing all that stuff. And so... We need to come up with some other ways, but we have to kind of manage with waste management because they are, we're, we're, you know, they, we have to partner with them, right? I don't know why we get picked up twice a, a week. I have no idea. I, know how it's, I don't know why it started that way, but it's, it seems like it's a waste of energy, first of all, right? Is it my just opinion? I'm just... Maybe I'm just no, no, I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know, because in America it's different. Everything is combined, and even with our recyclables, um, most of the general public doesn't even really know what to really recycle. And so they end up um, 
I don't know, the number is staggering, like you may know it more than me, but it's like I think like 85% of things that people are recycling is contaminated and then goes right back into the landfill. Right. So, um, right. we, you know, that's why like what's happening in Europe is different in America. We'll hopefully get there because every community has what's it's different in different countries, but like say in the UK it's called a tip. Um, and your community has several tip locations, and uh, it's up to you to dispose of your goods the way that they're supposed to be disposed of. So if you have batteries, if you have electronics, mm -hmm. if you have things like that, that is up to you because you are the consumer right. to uh, dispose of those properly. Um, I'm not doing that now. Like, I have batteries, and like, where do I go with these batteries? Yeah. Like, I, I'm holding a box of batteries because I don't want to throw them away. Yeah. That's the wrong thing to do. And there's no other place to put it, but you're right, 85% just goes, you think that you're really recycling, you think of pizza box, okay, right, that's, right. that's actually, that's cardboard, right? Mm -hmm. Well, no, that doesn't get recycled. All those things have a little thing on it that looks like it says, my kids go, that says recyclable. And I'm like, yeah, it, right. it is <laughs> recyclable if you, if you recycle it, right. like you can use that container again. You could almost shred it and compost it, except some of it will be contaminated so that you can't anyway. So we all have to think differently and we don't want, and you're right, Germany, and we, we can't reinvent the wheel. There's somebody doing it right now the proper way. I know we are a small city, but we do have to do things and make a change. Right here, I make, a, I, I make personal changes right here every single day with myself. And I have to, but I, I don't know how to, yes. to well, distribute we, that. We but, have a video a documentary coming out soon that we, the city, hired Balance for Earth to do. And so that, it's, it's, it's pretty good, but it basically focuses on the problems with the, in the recycling industry and the way it is, it is now, and talks about the waste and, you know, the fact that most of it goes to the landfill. And then uh, basically is primarily a call for people to reduce, because right now recycling, like we're, we're basically saying that recycling is the last option, the last resort. It is not the end-all, be-all that people think it is. Right. I mean, we, we took a tour of, and that might be a good idea is to get you guys to go on another tour since we have so many new board members, but taking a tour of the waste management facility is so enlightening. I mean, mm -hmm. when we were there, I think the um, facility was shut down three times with plastic bags just while we were just doing the tour. And um, I think we saw, that, I mean, people recycled a hose and it got caught in one of the front loaders, and when they were moving the front loader, it snapped and went flying. It was, it was probably the most dangerous place yeah. to work that I've ever seen. And, and walking in as the city manager, I was looking around going, I bet their workers' comp is really high. <laughs> but they, um, you know, they, the glass, because of the single stream, while it was good intentions, unfortunately the glass contaminates a lot of the recycling in the end because it breaks and it gets all over. And so there is shattered glass everywhere in this, in this facility. And the sad part is, if for recycling to be successful, there has to be a market for the end product. Mm -hmm. And there is no market right now for any plastic containers that are thin plastic. So those thin water bottles, those um, plastic where your produce comes in, all of that it just gets thrown in the landfill. They don't even they don't even separate it anymore because there's no market for it. The only market that's out there right now for plastic is like Coke bottle, two liter Cokes, you know, milk jugs, the heavier plastic. That's the only market they have now. And even then, you know, it just takes an enormous amount of cleaning because people just don't really recycle well. Yeah, we just have to start reducing, yeah. I mean, reducing and reusing ourselves because those those recyclable bags, I think the research is 120 times you have to right. use it, right? Yeah. For one. So it, who uses that 120 times? Right. I mean, we do, but will it last even 120 times? So right. Well, I think the other, you know, like we're when we were there, a propane tank blew up mm -hmm. because people put it in the recycle bin. It literally blew up. And, you know, these are workers, you know, and then you should see how fast they work, too. I mean, just separating all that mess. And then after a while, it gets to a point where they just let the whole thing go because it's too full of trash. So it, they do not recycle. They, everybody who thinks that what they're putting in that recycle bin 
is going to be reused and recycled is I mean, kidding we should, themselves. We should just have that class again. I think Nick had that class mm -hmm. about recycling, but it's hard to get the public out here to say, we need to talk about recycling and there's, you know, well, there's no consistent message, and that is part of the documentary, too, is how, you know, all the communities do it differently, so there's no consistent message to the public of what they should be recycling. And the other problem is, is it is market-based. So if there's no market for it, and that changes. So how many times do you change your message, you know? Um, so that's an issue. So really what we decided on was we really need to just get the message out that people need to reduce. And that's what I was going to say, John, that it, you know, we're without recycling, it's just reducing. And Satellite Beach being an innovative city for uh, the whole east coast of Florida, um, for some of these things is amazing because if you can get the reduction of little things that the city can do, like, um, you know, maybe just using foil or uh, plastic bags as to-go boxes or things like that, that is a huge reduction of waste, then people will just, it'll become the norm. Here for, and then people think twice about what they're actually putting in their own if they can't even go somewhere and get it. I, I think that we, excuse me, I think that we need to create some type of design summit to find ways to recycle the plastics that we're recycling. Like, what can we do locally with these plastics we're putting? And maybe we can start collecting them for a local business that has an idea for these plastics. Oh, there's there's others too. Uh, you mentioned batteries. Now, if you replace an automobile battery, you pay a quarter fee, and you know it goes back, and it, it is torn apart, and the, and the, at least the lead plates and things are reused. Uh, electronics really should be, and that ideally there would be, if you make it and you sell it, you will buy back when it's not wanted anymore. And then they need to figure. Now Dell has has is different than Apple. Dell builds their boxes in such a way that uh, when you don't want it and you send it back, either it isn't working or just because you bought a fancier one, uh, they can pull it apart or somebody can buy them as refuse by the by the crate load. And there are companies that refurbish them, pull out the parts and everything, put them back together. There's a website I go to. You can, you can buy them for 25% of what the new cost is, and they're warranted for a year. They've got all the bells and whistles and things. Uh, and and so there's... I, I have a thought. Do I go? Just as a couple of recommendations to keep us moving and, and, and on, the, on the agenda. Uh, maybe this would be something that be discussed then as an Earth Day action, either a pledge or an activity. Uh, we're going to have some different vendors there that specifically are there to recycle, like Recycle Brazil Art. They're one of the local companies that do exactly what you're talking about, and others that are there to recycle electronics. You know, those types of vendors are the types of people who want to you know, bring out. There's a presentation that you want to have? You know, it would be good because Titusville also had an, an interest in touring that facility. Mm -hmm. It might be good to get the Brevard Working Group to schedule a sustainability board tour. Okay. of the facility with all the boards coming because I'm telling you the minute you go into this facility you'll be it'll change your mind whatever you're thinking right now it'll be different later because waste management has done and they'll tell you right off the bat that um, they have uh, managers there that will find a buyer they work really hard to find buyers for, for weird stuff that they get in so like the cat litter bins, they finally found a buyer for that. And, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll save them up and, and you'll see like a whole um, section of their thing full of these, you know, cat litter bins. And they, they, you know, last time I was there, she was like, yeah, we finally found a buyer for that. So, we, you know, it, you know and it, so they're proud of that. And then they, they are working right now on the state level to change the laws because Single stream has really ruined their ability to get some of these recycles done. And so if you include glass, they're wanting to change the law so they can exclude glass, basically, because it doesn't work anymore for them in, in the single stream world. And so what they but what they do right now is they get weight on when they move when they pull the truck in before they get into the facility. And that's the requirements that they're required to meet is that weight. And now, and they don't get, they don't get um, 
rated on what comes out of the facility and what actually gets recycled. So they, they have a problem with that. And so that until that law changes, they're kind of stuck accepting all the stuff that they can't do anything with. And so they're right now trying to get those changed. So, um, you know, when you hear it from their perspective, it's a totally different, you know, it's, a lot, it's definitely a mind changer for me. Well, actually, Courtney, you just come up with what I will, what, what in my mind was the types of things that the city could do, the board. And that is to advocate right. for that mm -hmm. and find other things like recycling electronics. Advocate that Tallahassee, you know, take a stand right. somehow that's rational. And uh, so that's kind of the thing. I, I think not just the physical global change. And it's interesting you mentioned cat litter because I actually sent Waste management probably two months ago, one of their things and said, I've got cat litter boxes piled up, you know, they're whatever it is, the, the symbol. What do I do? I never got a response back. Mm -hmm. So we went into the waste stream, mm -hmm. which is kind of too bad. Uh, but I suspected that if I put them in, you know, that they'd be considered contamination. They were nice, clean. We use them for water buckets. You know, once you I mean, it's all fresh litter, not used litter. What the heck? I make a point to buy it in cardboard boxes. Mm -hmm. I, I really do. I won't buy plastic things anymore. But after seeing that, because you realize, wow, if, if it wasn't for that one enterprising staff member at Waste Management that worked really hard to find a buyer, those were all gone in the waste, you know. Actually, I, you know, when, when uh, Rex started the, what was it, redo, re Reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, you know, you could add a bunch of other re's, like refuse. Mm -hmm. It's not if it's not packaged properly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like and you know, so you, you can <laughs> expand it at both ends. Yeah. Is kind of changing so, the culture. So at your next meeting, I think we can have a, a tour date and stuff like that. Right. And yeah, then, does that include the landfill as well? Um, I did last time. We could take you to the land. That's the county yeah. runs the landfill. I see that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a whole other. <laughs> yeah. well, Where is that? Uh, the right the county landfill? Yeah, right. Okay. Sure. Well, they do have, they've got their uh, methane capture generator system up there. Yeah. Plus whatever else. But, but they, um, so we can have that for you at your February meeting, and we could probably. Um, let you see the documentary about it. It'll be right. Yeah, you can screen it. Um, and then we we're going to have a community, you know, viewing somewhere. We're trying to figure that out. And if you have any suggestions, let me know. <laughs> you, know you, you, you mentioned a, a, a video. Uh, you know, immediately I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to make a professional video of what you folks experienced? At the recycle station, but the problem is, if you did that, you'd probably make people so despondent about the whole situation. They say, "Heck with it! I'm just going to put it in the trash and be done with it." So you, there, there's an interesting balancing act here. Well, that's the, the thing that you know waste management wants to get across is, you know, don't don't recycle everything. Recycle well, and you know, rinse out your recycling. It needs to be clean. If it's not clean, they throw it out. So, you know, when you get that cat food can, and if you don't rinse it out and let it dry, it's going to go in the landfill. Mm -hmm. So people don't know this stuff, and that's, you know, the, one of the challenges. And I think, well, they're trying to get that, um, those laws changed, you know, they're coming up with that education piece. Because it, it is interesting, if you talk to, and that's part of the, the I'm like spilling all the beans with the documentary, but um, if you talk to waste companies, they talk about the education needs mm -hmm. all the time, but they never do it. <laughs> you know, nobody ever does it. Like we all talk about, it. oh, we need to educate the public, but we just never do it. And that's part of that documentary is, you know, you know, one of the things that we can do as a community is educate our residents and how to do it well. But the what we're trying to wait for, because um, it's hard to change your message constantly. When, with the changing laws, and so we were hoping to see this legislative session if they were, you know, at least somewhat successful in getting some of those changes done. So. But I agree that's something the board could do, and if we tour the facility and we make that known to waste management, they may take some 
you know, take you up on that. Where you can pass a resolution supporting their, you know, changes if that's something you like, you know. Yeah. Sometimes their goals and our goals are different, you know, so you need to make sure yeah, you but, like what they're doing. <laughs> but this may be a case where they align and it would be not, I mean, the fluoride resolution here didn't apparently sway the folks in Melbourne, but uh, if we did it and then began mm -hmm. jawboning other communities, maybe, mm -hmm. or even got people to, you know, you made the comments about the A1A safety issue, you know, send me letters and I'll forward them to where they belong and right. do it that way too. Yeah. So we can have that ready for the next one. But the other thing is that if you don't care about the environment, you may care about the money, right? Because we get yeah. money from recycling, so if we do it better, we get more money mm -hmm. for the city. Yeah. And it would be nice to get more you money. Know, if, well, and cardboard is recycled very easily. Yeah. So all of those Amazon deliveries everybody's worried about, you know, goes right back into more Amazon deliveries. <laughs> I read somewhere that they were planning some kind of, or talking about some kind of a, they would take them back even. And I think it was just, but then I thought, what about all the fuel to collect all these cardboard boxes? You can share in compost. Right. So the package stores, um, you could bring them to them and they'll take them. Well, actually, actually use them. One of the things we do with uh, uh, the single-use bags that we accumulate, my wife takes the good ones, folds them up nice, and uh, takes them to a, a small business where they use them instead of, you know, other stuff for pizza. They get a second life anyway. All right. Okay. We've got it. I keep talking about <laughs> so, Yeah, we can uh, talk about this forever. Any uh, further public comment on that? Please state your name. David Floyd, 140 Sherwood Avenue. So yeah, I think this is a great idea. Um, but what I would suggest is maybe going after the, the low-hanging fruit, which is um, what I think is probably yard waste. And I don't know if we can um, maybe work with waste management to, to have the yard waste um, composted or, or shredded locally and then use that back in the community for public works, for homeowners. I'm kind of envisioning like a, almost like a make a difference day, you know how we have a surf sign? Mm -hmm. Have that for the city. Where the city, you know, has um, compost available and maybe public works can take it around and, um, or I, I don't know, you'd, you'd have to figure out the best way to stage it, but to get things growing with each side, you really need a lot of compost. Mm -hmm. So, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we truck out of here, mm -hmm. which could be reused for schools, for, mm -hmm. for a lot of different places. So that might be something that we can negotiate with waste management, kind of, kind of get them thinking a little bit more forward. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other stuff, recycling, that's that's a tough tough thing to solve. Um, David, are you talking about just uh, the grass clippings one time, like a 420 day or something like, you know, don't smoke it, cut it? Or are you talking about like like just doing it like on a continuous basis, like once a week, like you have grass clippings? Grass clippings? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> I think more trees. No, I'm just talking about yard waste in general. I've been writing a lot of yard waste because I have a Yeah, right, like even just palm fronds. I mean, like you just shredded palm fronds. You, you do that on Mondays. I thought you were talking about like really yeah. chopping it up. Like, yeah. that's then, that's well, that's I, that's I mean, problem. they take all that stuff across the river over to the mainland. On Mondays. And they grind it up and they turn it into compost. Right. The problem is, if you want it as a homeowner, you got to run over there with your trailer or whatever and bring it back here. I would kind of rather it be composted here, and they, they oh, so the machines that, that shred it up are, are portable machines. Well, over there they're not. That's an industrial-sized grinder. No, it's portable. Yeah, people put all kinds of yeah, stuff. Yeah, those there. things you can move those. They, they're huge, okay. but they can be moved. And, and, and you know, maybe a thousand acres, maybe some kind of deal could be cut up there where 
That's that's the only place I can really think of where you could do it. Or if you had a place, let's say, at the sports park that once a month or something, uh, public works or somebody else that, that wanted to do it, go over with a mid-sized truck, get a, get a load. I mean, I, I wanted mulch once. I went over with, with my yeah, truck and they just dumped it in and you drive it's off. Great. It's and amazing what it does for... And so the point is that if you could have it, what you're saying is if it were local, people could, instead of going, right. so you could make keep maintain a pile here that was available to people to mm -hmm. use. Well, th this kind of goes back to when I was working at um, Delora. We, we did this big planting project where we brought in all these plants, and we tried to get mulch on them because that's like the first thing you have to do, and that's in the sandy soil that we have here. And that worked for a while, but then eventually all the volunteers kind of disappeared and the plants without the mulch, they, you know, the soil just went back to sand and peat, and a lot of them died. But, yeah. Um, so yeah, it can do wondrous things for the city. Um, I mean, even better than that is to compost it in your yard, but you're probably not going to be able to get everybody to do that. But to me, that's the, that's the biggest low-hanging fruit that you could go after right now mm -hmm. because until and single-use plastics will probably resolve themselves over time because there's so much opposition to them now that I think um, sooner or later you're not going to they're not you're not going to see them or or what's what's going to be made is going to be mm -hmm. hopefully you know biodegradable stuff. Like that. Yeah, my one of the things I I used to live in Colorado. I lived in Broomfield. It's just by Boulder. But one of the things I miss is we had a mulch mountain. That, that was our name for it. It was right next to the recycle um, plant, actually. So you bring, your, they picked up what you're talking about, but they only picked it at a narrow list. So it was only, and then they would report out what was in that mulch mountain. Because there's a giant pile of mulch that my kids played on. Probably shouldn't have. It's dangerous. <laughs> but, I mean, we used that thing monthly, and everyone just lined up every Saturday. It was the yeah, greatest. I mean, you, can, you can go over here and get yeah, in yeah. Some, on Sarna Road. Yeah. Um, and they have different types. They have golden you know, mulch. like golden chips and or wood chip type mulch. Right, you know have. what's come, what, what's in it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's the that's the, the thing picture. too. Is you, yeah, if you get diseased plants, insects, right? You, you kind of want to compost it and get it hot so that you kill all this weed seeds and all the nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I've understood that they, you know, the huge piles there were, you know, you, the down at the bottom, it'd be plenty hot if oh, they, they get pulling hot, that yeah. out. Yeah, and they have you have to turn them, and you know, so it's an it's an operation. They use it in the landfill too. They they yeah. spread it over the yeah. um, the garbage to make it you know, better. But. You know what's interesting at the schoolhouse, um, we actually kind of have a little agreement with uh, what's that company? As As Aswop, you know, this one Yeah, yeah, we're we're because we use um, uh, what's it called mulch. Yeah, in backyards for play areas, and we're actually a dump site for them, so that they, if they ever have something in our area, they don't have to travel all the way. Yeah, you just want to make sure what what they oh, they, what they sure. shipped out is. They make sure they can all use certain trees like and so forth. All the peppers, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you might not want that. But so. it might it may not be that difficult for us to be a, a dump site for them or create Community a dump garden. Site. That'd be another good location. But you know, it sounds to me like we probably ought to schedule almost a meeting just like we're doing now. I mean, how long have we been on this to, to try to... What, when does the city renegotiate the contract with waste management? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we just did that. Yes, did. About three years ago. And okay. it was... It's, it's I mean, there's other companies out there, out there too, right? That mm -hmm. we could, that yeah, there's Waste Pro. Waste Pro. They're the only ones that bid... Uh, in addition to waste management, and they didn't even come close to the price of this waste management. Yeah. So it's just, and then, you know, switching, anytime you mess with people's trash, it's a very difficult process. And I don't know why people love their trash so much, but it's, even the days, you know, the reason why we do it two times a week is there's a large segment of the population out there that wants two times a week pickup, you know. So that that whole um, operation, we're not touching that contract for 20 years. So, I mean, that's but do, do people that have the larger bins, do they pay more? Or is no. it, no? See, there should be something there. If you're generating more trash, you should pay more. 
Yeah, I mean, that, like, that's difficult to do. In a little while, just in a few years, it's going to actually cost money to throw things away. I don't care what it is, it's going to cost you money. Well, and actually, in, 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 that. in Appleton, Wisconsin, as I recall, some years ago, you basically paid by the pound, as it were. In other words, it wasn't just a flat rate. It was the more weight you put in, the more you pay. Yeah, California has different size bends that you pay for. Mm -hmm. I mean, we Colorado. have two huge cans. I could throw a lot of one stuff. One is in. for yard waste and one is for trash. And then if you have more than that, you just pile it out of the street and you call them up and they come get it. Mm -hmm. You can't do that in Canada, by the way. Mm -hmm. You can't even put a couch or anything out of the street. They'll find you. You're not supposed to put you microwaves in pay somebody to take in. People think they can throw everything in there. If it fits in that garbage can, you think you can throw it away. Yeah. So anyway, that, that's what So what, what we could do is since we have uh, February is kind of booked already for your meeting for that with the recycling um, ideas. And then um, I'm going to clog up your March meeting with some other stuff. <laughs> And um, that, that I'm going to talk about in a minute, but um, we could add that, you know, the idea of the, the central composting, because the thing is, is we got, we kind of have to manage our time, and so we do it well, you know, each of these initiatives. So I would recommend if you want to, which one you want to do, if you want to do recycling first, um, or um, composting, we can, we can focus on that. Uh, you know, which ones you want to do, prioritize first. I mean, once you get it moving, then you can probably start talking about them together, but... Um, You're talking about different meetings, or...? Yeah. Okay, my question would be, I would think that discussion with, on recycling would go better after we had visited the site, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does that determine which order it goes in, then? <clears throat> I, I don't think recycling first before you go to composting because composting is going to be in more spring, more foliage, and you know more cuttings and things like that. Yeah. Okay. I will. So, I will say real quick. Um, in the sustainability action plan, there is a green achievement target specifically targeting composting. Mm -hmm. um, it it does state with waste management. However, if we wanted to move towards that in the next three years, composting is on there as well. And it did sound like we may have another potential partner, which would be Asplund. So that's, you know, there, all of these are pretty complicated items. And so, you know, we would be, it would, they need to have time to get the background and all that information for your, for your meeting. So um, if you want to start on recycling in February, um, we are going to clog up your meeting in March, and then we can maybe in the April meeting focus on the composting and by then they'll have a pretty good, you know, background of some of the options that we could look at. Um, and we'll probably end up calling you too. So, so if I can yeah, jump yeah. off that and add, remember the composting workshop was designed to begin this process right. of having a composting program. This will be in combination with Keep of Our Beautiful and that will help them collect the data so that they can go to the county to talk about larger scale composting, which, as Alexis mentioned, is part of the Sustainability Action Plan. Um, so that is in motion, and we do want to set some time aside to talk about Earth Day as well. So just to keep that schedule on track. Mm -hmm. uh, also, in regards to the, the idea of the, uh, the yard waste, I think that might be another good one to bring up to the working group, the Bovard Sustainability Working Group. And there's a lot of members from waste management at that meeting. <laughs> who will be able to give me some information that I can, you know, look at research and bring back maybe in, in May or, or later on after. Because we could also look at bringing some ideas, because I was thinking, you know, we could probably start the program with just the city's trash yard waste alone, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so we might want to talk, you know, so those are some of the options that we would have to research and bring back to you, and that'll take, that'll take some time. Um, let me see if I can remember what I wanted to say. I think I talked to um, one of the city workers, and they said that you had uh, the city owns a big, like the Altec, the big shredder mulcher. Uh, he thought, but okay, well, that's just what he thought. Sure, but can, anyway, yeah, so. so we hmm? small chip on Samson's. They can ship things that are about that big. Mm. Very small. The chip on Samson's. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, there's a, like, the FPL went around and trimmed all the trees, if you remember, um, around the whole city. And then they just um, took that mulch and put it in the truck and shipped it off. But is there, like, a couple times a year that we could just um, have the city get a contract or rent a big, you know, the $30,000, $50,000 Altec? big, huge shredder mulcher. Everybody puts out their yard waste and have it mulched back into their own yard, and then you do that twice a year. Um, I mean, you would want it more, but I'm just saying that's an option, too. Mm -hmm. So we could do that, whereas you would have your own mulch. You wouldn't have to worry too much about um, collecting other people's um, whatever they have. So you could keep all your own stuff in your own yard. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I know they do that. But I mean, I'm just throwing out an idea. Okay, I'm done. So, yeah. All right. Any further public comments? No. All right. Next order of business. Um, discuss take action on creation of a subcommittee to implement the city having a 100% renewable energy by 2050. So this is a subcommittee that we need to establish to focus on this initiative. And so whether it be all of you on the committee or some of you who want to serve, but it would be a different meeting that we'd have to schedule maybe before this one, you know, um, so we can start on this initiative itself. Um, it's a pretty big initiative, and we've had some preliminary meetings with FPL, and um, John's joined us for some of those and um, getting, getting some ideas on what, how to move forward. Um, so we've, FPL has agreed to come and speak to the subcommittee for the first meeting and kind of give an overview of what they're doing um, and give us kind of a starting point. So if that's something you all are interested in doing, that would be our recommendation because it is a complicated subject. So to do that, and you can already see that your board meetings are getting clogged. So I'd, you know, to be able to focus on that the way it should be focused on, we would recommend a, a separate committee for that. Committee. Uh, I I wouldn't mind coming in an hour earlier for something like that. That okay. seems awesome. Now, how long would that subcommittee last? How long? Just as like long eight as eight years. we get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we get a plan. Five days at that. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm not aware of this. So is that, are you saying the actual city buildings, or are you talking about the city of Seattle? If I may, uh, for Jennifer, the uh, Red 100 was a decision that the board made with the Sierra Club, and then the council approved it. The concept is that in uh, a number of years, until 2030, the city itself will go to all renewables, and then by 2050, the city wide will go to all renewables by getting our energy from a renewable source by 2050, 100, ready for 100. There's a lot of other cities that are doing it. Uh, I believe there's one in Colorado that's actually already there. So there's some models out there. We there's several of them that are that are there, but they have special right. We don't use our own power like Orlando does. We get our power from FPL. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on there. Um, like Courtney had said, we've already started with some conversations, and that they'll be the first presenter. And then I think having Sierra Club back as well as another presenter would probably be a good idea. Um, I'm okay. Can I do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. do, what do you think about doing an hour? Like starting at six? Start at six, yeah. Um, that would be best for the staff because we're already here anyway. <laughs> 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 um, but to, that would be better than having another night for us. Yeah. So do we need to invite more people to be on that board? It, it's entirely up to you all. I mean, if you guys just want to start an hour earlier for that express purpose, mm -hmm. then, then this would be fine. You know, the amount the board members here. We probably we'll be inviting a lot of people to present to you though, okay. so you could, we, we can educate us and you on options. Mm -hmm. Sound like a plan? Yes. Do we have a motion? So move. Second. We need to. Did somebody say second? Did we have a motion? Okay. Uh, John motion. Move. On the subcommittee. David Leon? Yes. And, uh, Jan Boy? Yes. <laughs> Jennifer Turner? Yes. John Curtis? 
Yes. Agreed. Yes. Okay. All right. Oops. I forgot to ask for any further public <laughs> comment. Is there any further public comment? No. All right. Next order of business. Discuss. Take action on chair and vice chair positions. Do you want to continue? I absolutely do. Yes. I'll move that you be chair. I second. Yes. 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 Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the second. The second spot. Co-chair. Co-chair. Who wants to be the vice chair? I really don't. <laughs> Did he can you are talkative. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> Finish your statement. Educated. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm happy to serve, but happy to participate also. So I'm happy to I'm happy to lean in or lean out. I think Jen's an obvious choice. Yeah. I would second that. Maybe I should ask what's involved first. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, just I'll move. Do you want a second? Or yeah, I'll second. second. I'll second. Yes. 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 You sit kind of here or there. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Just so keep moving. Is that here? Right. Public comment. Oh, I'm really. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do that, but. I was made for that job. No. <laughs> Are there any further public comments? Thank you. <laughs> no? All right. All right. Next order of business, board member comments. I know we have a couple. Mine might be short, but I just, I, I would um, like to thank um, the city manager and the city council um, for your um, statements this month in city council meetings regarding the crosswalks and our built environment. Um, I just wanted to briefly make mention of that because um, it's been clearly on all of our minds with um, you know complete streets and about our living environment and how we're moving the city <laughs> infrastructure-wise. For I mean, this has been a conversation for decades. Um, like I, I, you know, I didn't. Even, I did not know Self, Sophia Nelson, but it was devastating, as I think it was for most everyone in this city. And it's not the first tragedy. Um, anyway, I, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I say I mean, it hits us hard, and I think it will hit us, continues to hit us hard. And I think it just underscores that my immediate reaction was. How do we lean in more? But I, I wanted to just say that we are already doing the things to move in that direction. And I just doubly appreciated the explicit and very quick reaction and response um, about the efforts that week. So thank you. Yeah. May I express something along that line? Mm -hmm. Along those lines? This is just a thought I've, I've been thinking about for a while. Um, we had a young lady in. Um, downtown Melbourne, who was a uh, cheerleading coach, really beautiful young lady. Um, I only know her from just um, short hellos. She's a very nice person, and she's a huge cheerleading coach, and she was hit by a car. And ever since then, I've always had a, an idea for a memorial. Unfortunately, it was near a light post, just like this young lady. Um, and I've always... They still have a memorial there. It's been like three or four years now. Mm -hmm. But what if, what if we, this light post, a light post, and I've seen the blue ribbons around town, mm -hmm. what if uh, we painted this one light post? What if we painted it with a blue ribbon that went all the way up, it, mm -hmm. up the uh, light post as kind of a memorial? Mm -hmm. I know, I, I, I don't, I don't know how that would make people feel. That's why I'm putting it out there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I personally think it might be beautiful to kind of uh, memorialize somebody. Mm -hmm. I know that we have uh, Officer 
one of our officers who was hit down by bullets. And that was one of my friend's fathers growing up. And I, I've often thought, like, wow, that light post right there could even be kind of like a, a memorial mm -hmm. if it was painted in, in a certain way. What, what do you think about an idea like that? Because these ribbons that we have all over town, I mean, they are getting my attention. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm definitely more vigilant to mm -hmm. the people crossing the streets because of those ribbons. Yeah. Um, it is something that I wouldn't mind seeing, you know, around longer. And I'm just thinking of a creative and uh, artistic way of of keeping that reminder yeah, out. We there. can look into it. I think we've had the same, not that particular idea, but, but at, you know, people asking us how we're going to, mm -hmm. um, you know, could we have a sign, you know. Um, and we were, we've been in lots of discussions with DOT. They they met a lot of our, um, they, they're going to implement a lot of our requests. Um, so that's going to be presented, I think, on February 5th to the City Council by the DOT. But the, um, one of the requests that we had was, you know, can we have entrance signage? And, you know, an idea from one of our council members was to put the blue ribbon shape on the mm -hmm. sign, you know, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. we could definitely look into it and see if that's possible. Mm -hmm. It's not, they're not our polls, so right. we have to get permission to do that. But, I mean, I don't know if DOT, um, how they would feel about that, but I can ask. This is the image of mm -hmm. a ribbon going up to heaven, right. <laughs> if you yeah. will. That has always uh, sparked me as kind of a cool mm -hmm. idea for a memorial for somebody yeah. who got hit by her or was killed in a certain spot. I know we, we lost a few people last year, right? Do you have um, the chiropractor? Right. From the we, yeah, we yeah. lost Dr. Epstein. Mm -hmm. Dr. Epstein. We've mm -hmm. had uh, Chris Farrell, he was on my baseball team, and uh, I mean, uh, Dominic Sippen. It was on my five, baseball team in 1985. There were two baseball players that were on my baseball team that ran across the street from a, from a uh, football game from Satellite High School. Mm -hmm. I mean, those were kids. Those were guys who were 16 years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I never forget those guys, you know. So you think about that. And, and uh, you know, uh, police officer Hartman. Yeah, Hartman I mean, so. uh, he was – I. I, it devastated that family. Uh, the community. It was an amazing in the community. It was an amazing family. You know, it's uh, interesting. <clears throat> I asked Chief Pearson uh, if they had a record of accidents and fatalities, and it only goes back, I think, to 2014, and misses all those others that. Uh, I wouldn't just because we requested it that way. Hmm? That's we just requested the you know, the amount of pedestrian deaths in the last Okay, I don't know how far back you can go because I remember there was, I think, a kid crossing with a, uh, with a surfboard someplace. I thought it was like in the Harwood area or something like that, you know. The guy in the, in the, in the uh, middle lane. Uh, you know, and there's, there's been quite a few, more than our share, I think. And you just look back a couple of years, and maybe it doesn't feel so bad, but if you go back more, you find that, when, and like the Hartman thing, that was two police officers at one, one hit. Uh, but, uh, uh, but we, and, I mean, we can go on and on about it. I know that we're not in charge of this, so it's hard to, but I drove from Cocoa Beach all the way down to um, Sebastian Inlet to see how the how that the uh, miles per hour changes and fluctuates. And you're right, I mean, it does need to be reduced. Mm -hmm. We are not in charge of any of this, so it's hard for me to even comment on that. But we, mm -hmm. we as you're right, thank you, Courtney, for standing up for our community. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the city did, and, and it was mentioned at the council meeting, had, I don't know whether it still has to the extent, uh, a, uh, People had this feeling you don't drive impaired and satellite. I remember being at the, at the uh, courthouse, and uh, there were a couple guys talking in the hall, and the one guy said, I come up, I don't go through Satellite Beach, I go across to the mainland, I go across and come back out again, was how badly he felt about Satellite Beach. And if you had the history of the fatalities on A1A, you know, you could put at each end of the city, 
some kind of marker that, that lists, and you just keep adding to it if you had to, kind of as a, you know, drive careful or something, you know, kind of a fail threat or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. Uh, Thank you, Jennifer, for the, the comments. We'll get back to yeah. the options, as Chris had mentioned. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, any further public comment? Dave? No. All right. Next order of business. Oh, any more of a board comments? No. Courtney needs to get home. No. Yeah, she does. It's 14 minutes over. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Let's move on. Um, let's see. Agenda items for next month's meeting. We, I think that's already filled. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to right. be colliding up your March meeting with the okay. climate change conference plan amendments that I'd like you to review. So that'll take up your whole meeting because we're going to present, you know, the reasoning behind it, the data, and then what these comp plan amendments will do. And I'm hoping you'll take, you know, two or three meetings to go through them and, and give your recommendation on that. So, um, and then after that, after you um, get done with them, they'll go to the planning PAB, and then they'll go to council. So. All right. Let yeah. me know what's coming down. <laughs> Any further public comments? No. All right, next we have adoption of minutes from so moved. So moved. Was it too late to mention something? Oh, please. Um, I don't know if we'll have time or not, but um, so, and I don't know if this is important for the city, but um, uh, Florida, ha this area has three bat populations and they're all federally protected in the state of Florida. And um, every spring, right when um, everybody is pruning all their palm fronds and everything, getting ready for hurricane season, is their mating season and nesting season. So um, I know um, I just had a big thing with the base over that because I had the company that they had hired out, subcontracted out to go do all those, give me a number at the end on how many they saw. Mm -hmm. And um, they had over 600 bats downed. Wow. And the um, environmental head of, of environmental, um, she didn't even know, Lakeitha didn't even know that there was that many in this area. She was like, oh my, I had no idea. So um, they now have a contract that they can't do that during uh, mating season and nesting season. Um, that might be, you know, you could put, if you, since you know so much about it, like an educational post to our residents so we could put it on the sustainability Facebook page. Okay. Would that be something you could do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, maybe in the beach basket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So back to the adoption of minutes from December 11. John? Move. So moved. Second. Yes. 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 All right. The next meeting will be February 26. All right. That will be. I'll do it for you. Right. Oh. Are we going to go? Are we going to go an hour earlier? Because, I think so. Yes. I'm not six. We. What's that? Yeah. So we definitely are going to start at six, right? Yeah. 